Learning Cloud. Hi, I'm Siobhan Sarna and welcome. This is a very special presentation with Dr. Michael Ruscio. You may know him from his podcast. You may know him from his prolific research and dissemination of information that he then shares with the world from that research. He is a clinician. He is one of those thought leaders that you really want to have on your case if you've got a complicated case. And my co-host today is Dr. Allison Seebecker, world-renowned SIBO specialist. Hello. She, hello. She is my number one collaborator and she co-created the SIBO Recovery Roadmap course with me. And she also created the SIBO Pro course where she trains professionals on how to treat and think about and resolve SIBO with a proven method. Okay, today, yes, applause, applause for Dr. Allison Seebecker. <laughs> and applause, applause, applause for Dr. <laughs> El, Dr. Mike, Dr. Elemental. And, and, and do you, you want to see his wonderful products we're going to be talking about today? I went and got them. Oh, thanks. Show them. Go ahead, Allison, and show them up. Okay, so we have, this is Elemental Heal. I've got a lot of sun here. Uh, that's weight free. Here's a low carb one. We're going to explain the difference. We're going to explain the difference. So uh, thank you, Allison. So Dr. Ruscio, uh, I'm going to talk about you like you're not here for a second, Michael. Um, he realized the results that the elemental diet was getting for his patients, but he also knew that it tasted horrible or horrible, as I like to say. <laughs> and so he created his own formulas and better flavors and they taste good. And then he has all these tricks and ideas of efficacy and how to how increase compliance. We have been working with him for a really long time, and he has allowed us to have a 10% off coupon for the Elemental Heal if you wanted to order it with that link. And we really appreciate it. It doesn't change your price. Actually, you get 10% off, um, but it really helps when you use our link because it funds our work, which we appreciate. Thank you. And of course, this is a free presentation. Dr. Ruscio also has a wonderful website. Please use our link to get there. Um, it is drruscio.com and he is a DC and a naturopathic practitioner, Dr. Chiropractic, clinical researcher. It's been published, he has been published in peer reviewed medical journals and is a committee member of the Naturopathic Board of Gastroenterology Research Division. Very cool and officially welcome Dr. Ruscio. Hi, good to see you both, great to be back. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a long time, man. I had to book this a year ago. You're busy. Yeah, well, we're all busy, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. you're getting busier and busier, and Alice and I, we're all getting busier, which I guess, I guess is the point, right? We're, we're trying yeah. to help more people and right. steer them on the right path. So uh, thank you guys for having me on and also for doing the work that you're doing and disseminating and sharing the information that you're sharing. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So do you, I know you have some slides. Do you want to talk first? Or you want to dive right into the slides? Uh, maybe talk a little bit first. You know, I think it's helpful when we check in on maybe like a year of basis, hopefully more than that going forward, but just to kind of uh, maybe give a state of the union, if you will, regarding yes. healthcare and our kind of niche in healthcare. And one of the things that has been nice about the clinic growing now to be four doctors instead of just myself is you get a chance to see, well, you know, maybe what I was thinking, feeling, noticing was just me, my own confirmation bias, right? And once you can have a clinical model for doctors are operating in, and then compare notes across providers, you can start to see, is that signal true? And what's been very telling is not only are these things true, they're, they're seemingly getting worse. And, and what I mean, kind of Ray, state of the union, is people seem to have more and more information, leading them to be more confused, feeling as though everything has to be done totally strictly based upon the guidelines. Everything's very rigid. There's ubiquitous testing. So people just seem to be in this really unhealthy place psychologically where they're chasing numbers, they're letting the perfect be the enemy of the good, and they're not listening to their bodies. And I want to start with this framework of if you've got 17 questions about the elemental diet, you need to like get away from health research for a little while, go for a walk outside, call a friend, you know, pick up your paintbrush or your guitar, whatever it is, and just chill out because those fastidious details, thankfully, are not the difference between success and failure. In fact, oftentimes what I see is someone isn't doing something that could help them because they're convinced it won't help them because of something they read about some mechanism somewhere rather than just trying whatever the therapy is. And oftentimes in the clinic, people will come in and say, well, I didn't do that because 
this candida diagnosis, which you know, oftentimes is a frivolous diagnosis or an incorrect diagnosis or a theoretical diagnosis. And we say, well, how about you try, let's, as just one example, say, up in your carbohydrate intake a little bit. Because we understand you've read all this stuff about how carbs are bad for candida and you know, carbs are why people in the US are overweight and sick and obese and what have you. But your hair is thinning, you're fatigued, depressed, you're not sleeping well, you're losing weight, you have all the signs and symptoms of someone who might be under eating carbs. Why don't you just try it for a few weeks? They come back in a few weeks later. Oh my goodness, I've gained some weight. I have better energy. I'm sleeping well. It's like, yeah. So all the information you read about how carbs could be bad led you to withhold these for so long that you actually made yourself worse. And so what I'm trying to say here in, in a roundabout, circuitous way, apologies if I'm going a little bit long, is if we can throw out a lot of the rules and just start experimenting, and appreciating and honoring our body's symptomatic response, this is usually the best path forward and to healing. I call here, that here. wearing it loosely. <laughs> wear, it, wear it loosely. Right? Here, here. Now, now, okay. hopefully you guys are all just loving what Dr. Ruscio said, because I sure am. And now you can understand why Michael and I have like two hour long conversations on the phone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. We do tend to say these kinds of things on and on. So thank you for saying that. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, you're you're someone who's helped me feel sane because sometimes I, I feel like so much of the field is in the other camp of of very you know fastidious analysis and and what have you. And then that's why we talk for so long. You're right because it's like oh my god, like this this can be a lot easier than than it's perceived to be. It's called, I call it SIBO panic as well. And so, you know, the overthinking, and I know that because I was there too. But if you think about a singer and they practice, 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 they know all the rules. And then when they go out into the concert hall, they let their talent shine. So it's great to know all the rules. It's great to have some data, but go out there and be you and listen to your body right. and, yeah. and really you know, follow that intuition as well. You're brilliant, right? We all know our bodies and then yeah. you have this extra data. So when you have been in the clinic, Michael, Dr. Ruscio, and I know you have done a lot of um, a lot of work with the elemental diet. Can you explain what the elemental diet is in case someone's just sort of like, I think I know what it is. I'm a beginner at this. Sure. Like, talk to us about sure. that. Let me cue up my, my screen share here, if that's cool. I'll share a few slides. I'm sorry, I'm not awesome yet with some of these bells and whistles, but you can see All this. All good. All good. Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'll just use these as a backdrop, but the elemental diet is a meal replacement that is hypoallergenic, essentially fiber and prebiotic free. And the simple way that these work is because these diets are hypoallergenic, you're not going to get the food reaction triggering that can lead to this kind of cascade of inflammation, leaky gut, and this whole sort of spiral. But along with that, the fact that they are essentially uber low FODMAP, and I'm sure your audience uh, is probably, you know, um, PhD thesis level educated on the low FODMAP diet at this point, um, you're, you also starve bacterial, and I think also fungal overgrowths, because nothing really gets past the first three feet or so of the small intestine. And, and so down the, the entire intestinal tract, the, you know, nearly 30 feet, you're not having a chance to feed overgrowth if it is present. And it, so this will function similar to something like a little FODMAP diet or rifaximin in the sense that the gut is probably a little bit skewed, meaning the microflora, whether it's true SIBO or whether it's dysbiosis, the less is more concept of you know uh, depriving the microbiota of feeding with prebiotics can actually be really effective in helping to reestablish what's known as eubiosis or or balance. So that's some of what you're seeing here. Uh, free digested meaning it absorbs within the first three or so feet. So that's where you get the starving effect and the rebalancing down the rest of the intestinal tract. Low fiber, easily absorbed hypoallergenic and therefore anti-inflammatory because if it's not stimulating an immune response, that reduces the inflammatory aspect of said immune response. And then that leads to repair of the gut over time. I, you know, fairly obvious, but should probably state it. And then they're nutritionally complete, meaning no replacement that has 
a protein, a carbohydrate, some have fats, others you add that to it and has a multivitamin, multimineral. So that's kind of the long short on what an elemental diet is. Okay, and who is the elemental diet for and who is it not for when you get there? Yeah. yeah. Um, and do you want me to kind of just go through these slides, Siobhan? Sure, or do you want sure. To go ahead and do the slides and then I'll pound you with questions after. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Um, <laughs> So just to build on this a little bit more, the protein can be in one of two forms, or really one of three forms. It can be an amino acid blend, or it can be either a whey protein or a partially hydrolyzed whey protein. This is where the example of, of uh, SIBO panic, because I think someone commented in, in one of the chats coming through, uh, people can say, well, you know, the, the study in SIBO was with vitamin X plus, and they used an amino acid powder, so that's all I'm going to use. And I refer to this as being evidence-based and also evidence-limited, meaning, well, what if we have a whole wealth of literature, let's say, in inflammatory bowel disease using partially hydrolyzed weight protein? And if we know that inflammatory bowel disease and IBS and SIBO play by a lot of the same rules, maybe we can relax right, some of the thinking in terms of how we apply this. And maybe we can use a partially hydrolyzed or even a weight protein. And it turns out that if you use something like whey protein, even if it's not partially hydrolyzed, that improves the flavor profile quite a bit, and it also can help reduce the cost. So irrespective of the protein source, they seem to be effective. And I think it's really important just to echo that because sometimes people get really fixated on wanting an amino acid rather than whey. And I found that people tend to do fairly well with whey protein. In fact, I'll spend a fair amount of time kind of talking people out of their fear of whey because they've lumped it in with all dairy. And so, you know, milk and whey protein aren't the same thing. A high quality whey protein can essentially be lactose and casein free. And then you have a carbohydrate source, usually maltodextrin, dextrose, or glucose. And the fat oftentimes comes in the form of a medium chain triglyceride MCT. And like we touched on before, there's vitamin, mineral, and electrolyte. And this is one of the studies that really helped me to inform some of my thinking regarding, well, maybe we can relax the guidelines with how we use elemental diets. So this was a meta-analysis of 27 randomized control trials in just over 1,000 patients. And what they found when looking at this cohort or cohorts with active Crohn's, and most of the research with elemental diets has been in inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis. There's only been one study in SIBO. As a quick aside, we're actually making some plans right now to do a small randomized control trial in IBS using a, and we'll come to this in a moment, what we call a hybrid approach, which is kind of the way we do it in the clinic, a relaxed application. But there's really a wealth of literature in Crohn's. So blah, blah, blah. all I have to say, they gave half the participants, or there was roughly half that were using a semi-elemental and the other half using a fully elemental. And they found the same remission rate, whether it was semi-elemental or fully elemental. So when we see data like this, it supports the point of, hey, let's relax a little bit and not worry about having you know, the, the Vivanex Plus, which tastes terrible. And part of the reason it tastes terrible is that amino acid powder, it's hard to get around the, the sort of pungent uh, taste. And this is where whey protein can really be the difference. Coming back to your earlier comment, Siobhan, about compliance, this can be the difference between someone doing it and someone saying, Ugh, I, I tried a glass of it. And I just couldn't get it down. And we don't have to worry about being so perfect because of data like this. And this, again, this is a meta analysis for about a, a thousand people. So it's a pretty quality data point. And people have probably heard about this study. This is sort of the, the, the seminal Pim and Pell study using the Vivanex Plus which, man, God bless these people who can do Vibonex Plus for 14 days. Because Vibonex Plus, uh, you know, it's nice to have that as an option, sure, but it, it's really hard to get down. I would describe the taste if you've uh, ever licked a postage stamp or, or the, the glue on an envelope. That's kind of how I would, uh, you know, uh, uh, give you an analogy for the taste. But anyway, so they found an 80% normalization rate of the SIBO breath tests and a 65% improvement rate in SIBO symptoms. They used it 14 days exclusively and 
I'll come to a study here in a moment that helps us understand that while this was helpful, we don't need to make use of the elemental diet this sort of robust. And I think this is the next slide I have queued up here. No, so this is a different study, but I wanted to make sure to tie in this one also. So this is a meta-analysis of 13 studies. And the key point here is that elemental dieting was more effective than food allergy testing elimination diets. And why I think this is so incredibly important and I'm sure Allison and Siobhan, you've probably seen this, people will notice that their personal experience oftentimes does not match what the labs say. Labs say I can't have blueberries. I feel fine on blueberries, right? So um, this study found that the highest improvement in a condition known as eosinophilic esophagitis which is this atopic inflammatory condition of the esophagus. People can feel like they have something stuck in their throat or this globus sensation. They saw the best results with an elemental diet. Um, and again, why I think this is so important is it performed much better than even doing a test. And some of these tests can be a thousand some odd dollars for food allergy avoidance. So it, it's money that really is, is not well spent. And then if people are overly avoiding food, that's not healthy psychosocially or psychologically or physiologically, right? Because then it can start under eating. And we have this whole sort of cascade, like I mentioned a moment ago, with someone under eating carbs, not sleeping well, hair is thinning, they're depressed, what have you. So um, just one study on the, I guess, superiority over testing. And this is one of the studies that was really pivotal in my early thinking, which was Crohn's patients in remission who are on the salazine, so it's an anti-inflammatory drug, they looked at these patients over a year as comparing them in two groups. One group did nothing, just an ad libitum diet. The other group replaced roughly half their calories per day with these elemental meal replacements. And what they found after a year was a vastly lower relapse rate in those replacing half their calories per day. It's about 64% relapse compared to about 34% relapse. And all they did was replace one or two meals per day with one of these shakes. And there was no adverse events, compliance was high, and body weight stayed the same. And again, this was really pivotal for me in the studies from 2006. And it showed me that, hey, we can use the elemental diet in what the research refers to as a hybrid application, meaning it doesn't have to be two weeks, doesn't have to be super strict. You can use it to replace breakfast, maybe lunch. And for a lot of people, this maps onto their daily routine anyway. I'm busy in the morning, I'm trying to get ready and fly out the door, or at least people used to fly out the door to work. Maybe they're flying to their home office now. But nevertheless, a lot of people seem to like something light and quick and easy in the morning. So it's not disruptive, and that's probably why the compliance was, uh, was high. And in this study, to just touch on the question that comes up sometimes, I think rightfully so, will a lower fiber, lower prebiotic diet be bad for the gut microbiota? And in this study, they did find that there was a reduction in richness and diversity when going on the elemental diet that quickly resolved when people went off of the elemental diet. But we have to contextualize this with the fact that the gut microbiota stool says are assessing the large intestine. Let me get this out of here. Uh, they're not assessing the small intestine. And why this is so crucial is because the large intestine, again, is what's assessed by these tests, it's five feet in length. It's responsible for minimal caloric and nutrient absorption. And it contains the majority of the gut microbiota. The large intestine, let me hide this here. Sorry, guys. The large intestine is not assessed by the microbiota tests. It's 22 feet in length. It absorbs 90 to 95% of calories. It's where leaky gut occurs. It has the most rich density of immune cells and GI receptors and it has less bacteria than the small intestine. And I love this from the journal of gut. It's important to note that we can live without a colon, but not without a small intestine. So 
if we see a finding like this last study that, well, you know, uh, the oatmeal diet may reduce gut microbiota diversity, we have to put that in context of, well, that's actually minimal in terms of the importance that the small intestine has. So, and I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, right? But this, I think, is really where the party is at in the GI and why we should be wary of not making all of our decisions centered around what happens to the microbiota diversity, again, because that's assessed mainly by stool, and that tells you what's going on in the large intestine, and it's not nearly as impactful on your body, on your immune system, as the small intestine is. And just the final point here I wanted to make uh, before I let you hammer me with some questions, um, this showcases the broad impacts that a healthy gut and a small intestine can have on the body. And this was a clinical trial in those with rheumatoid arthritis. And they found that the elemental diet was as effective as prednisone in reducing inflammation in this autoimmune condition of the joints. So I think it's important just to clarify, we can have sort of, you know, broad ranging impacts. And to your question earlier, Siobhan, I don't have necessarily the, the bottles here with me, but we That's have fine. three versions. We have traditional, low carb, and weight free, so that people can find the formula. You know, maybe if they're trying to be lower carb, we have a version for that. If people have qualified, they have a problem with whey protein. And if you haven't done this in isolation with high quality whey protein, I think it's worth trying because it's a very medicinal form of protein that tends to be very well tolerated. But if you have qualified, you have a problem. We have a whey free version and then the traditional. Uh, as well. And the yeah, ingredient labels for you here, you have your maltodextrin, you have some stevia, and we haven't found stevia to be a problem for the vast majority of people. It's also only a small amount. And then you'll see here, um, the low carb has a more sort of generous allotment of MCT, just to quickly show you the ingredient labels there. Uh, yeah, and I'll pause there. I had a few other things I wanted to tie in on sort of emotional health, but uh, oh. I'll, I'll by all means, no, no, by all means, please talk okay. about emotional health now. Yeah, we need it. So, as, as you guys probably know, I'm, I'm quite a bit of a nerd, and uh, I'm even nerdier now because we have two awesome research analysts on our team, and we have a PubMed save search on a number of topics. And so, as literature is being published, we're just catching all these studies and integrating them into sort of this larger narrative in terms of how do all these data points connect. And there's a few things here that aren't necessarily on the elemental diet, but I wanted to share these. This study by Gruger in neurogastroenterology and motility, I think was fascinating. So it's a randomized control trial, 40 IBS patients, about 50 healthy controls. They were given 1 billion, or yeah, uh, 1 billion, excuse me, CFU of bifidobacterium longum. I don't think the specific probiotic uh, species and strain matters, but I just want to give you that detail. They saw an 82% improvement in IBS, 61% improvement in anxiety, 61% in depression, improvements in sleep, and improvements in the cortisol awakening response. And this is what I wanted to draw your attention to. So these are the healthy controls, and they even divided the healthy controls into high stress and low stress. And you can see, you know, those who have you know, moderate or high stress. They have a slightly blunted cortisol awakening response, but it's pretty similar to the low stress individuals. But look at it in the IBS group. It's severely blunted. And that cortisol awakening response, as the name suggests, tells you how robust is someone's release of cortisol in the morning, which will help you get up, get out of bed, get on up to your day, not feel like you need like two hours before you're, you're kind of online. And look at what happened to them as they went on this probiotic formula. So here is their cortisol awakening response at baseline. At four weeks, look at the resurrection, wonderful. It's maintained to eight weeks. So they have normalization of their cortisol output. And what I love about this study by Gruber and colleagues is they stopped the intervention at eight weeks and then they wanted to see what would happen after people were off the probiotics for up to 12 weeks and 16 weeks. So four and eight weeks post-intervention. And look at what happens to the cortisol levels. They go right back down to normal. Wow. To, I'm sorry, to, to abnormal or to their sort of normal baseline. Yeah. And it also maps onto their IBS symptoms. So at baseline, they had high IBS symptoms. At week four, 
they had less IBS symptoms at week eight, even less. And then off the probiotics, IBS symptoms start coming back, which perfectly paralleled their cortisol awakening response. So there's sort of two or three things to take away from this. One, probiotics, I think, are an unsung hero of gut health. And two, if we have a successful gut intervention, not necessarily limited to probiotics, but if we, if we intervene successfully in the gut, we should see a lot of other things downstream improve, including the stress response. And that's essentially what they're concluding here uh, is that there seems to be a correlation between the stress response, cortisol levels, and people's IBS. And probably nothing new for us. I'm sure a lot of people who are tinkering with their gut notice that when their gut is healthier, they have clearer thinking, they have better energy, they have better sleep. But that's just the one point I wanted to share. And then one more, and then, sorry, I'll promise I'll stop talking and uh, let you uh, hammer me with some questions. But this also ties into the stress response. And this study was just so incredibly elegant. They had people fill out a questionnaire. How are you feeling? Are you stressed? Just a general sort of quality of life assessment. They then had them get into a functional MRI. And while they're in the MRI, they're having people do two things. One, math problems. Ah, for some people, that's scary, right? And yeah. they had them look at uh, distressed faces like you're seeing here. Oh, wow. And so they're looking at what's happening in the amygdala while they're either trying to solve a challenging math problem or looking at distressed faces. So we then had everyone go for either a walk in nature or a walk in the urban environment. So they, were, they split the groups, obviously. You know, half went into nature, half went into the urban environment. They get back in the MRI, do different challenging math problems, look at a different set of distressed faces, see what's going on in the amygdala, and they fill out another questionnaire in terms of how are you feeling. And look at what happens in, this is amygdala activation, in the groups before the walk and then after the walk. So the green bar are the people who went for the walk in nature. Look at the reduction in amygdala activation. It's tremendous. So this medial temporal lobe section of your brain, the amygdala, was greatly dampened when people went for a walk in nature. And they reported they felt less stressed, they had heightened enjoyment, and they had improved attention. And so this is why earlier I said, you know, if you have 17 questions about the elemental diet, just get away from the computer and go for a walk in nature because of this. And then the final point here is we want to weave in with this. Uh, there's the location of the amygdala. And the amygdala is responsible for stress, emotions, sympathetic, and immune activation. And this is the point I wanted to come to here. A different study, we were looking at low stress and high stress individuals in the kind of teal and the blue. And I'm looking at two different cytokines, and I think my floating bar here is in the way. I never know how to get rid of this. Can I hide this, Siobhan? Help me out. What do you want to do? Hide that. Okay. Sorry. Uh, I don't we even think you could see it's the control it. panel. We, could, we uh, couldn't see it. it, it okay. Everybody's Zoom is a little no, bit. I'm a neophyte with some of this stuff, so you have to no, It's all good. Me. All good. Um, so what you're looking at here is stressed versus non-stressed individuals. And what is their reaction to two different types of polysaccharide, right? PAM3 is the N terminal of a polysaccharide. It will stimulate total receptors one and two. And then LPS, lipopolysaccharide, as I'm sure your audience knows about, is what leaks through partially in leaky gut, will stimulate total like receptor four. So we wanted to give these different fragments of bacteria that would hit different receptors and then look at what is the immune response comparing low stress to high stress individuals. And you see consistently people who are more stressed have a higher degree of immune reactivity to lipopolysaccharide. So said a different way, if you're stressed and you have a degree of leaky gut, you will have a more robust immune reaction because of the stress. This is again, is why it's so important to be conscious of this sort of law of diminishing returns with health research and sort of involvement and rumination on how you're feeling. Because if it's leading to stress, it will literally make you more reactive. So you can, you can infer 
but you could be making yourself worse if you're spending too much time researching your your health and sort of worrying about your health. And I know it's it's easy for me to say, but yeah, I think part of our responsibility as healthcare providers is helping guide people on the correct path. And so there is such a thing as too much focus on your health, too much reading, too much you know webinaring, too much podcasting. And I understand the thinking is, well, if I can just figure out the problem, I'll get better. Mm-hmm. But sometimes that stress and worry and fear actually makes the problem worse. And like we showed in the previous slides, something like time and nature can diminish that activation of the amygdala and therefore some of the immune reactivity. Uh, so I just want to tie those few things in because my observation has been that sometimes the, the longer someone hasn't been feeling well, the more they get sucked into this kind of black hole of research and worry. And again, as someone who's been there, my heart goes out to you, I understand. But I think we have to make sure people continue to prioritize time with friends, time in nature, time for hobbies, and put some guardrails up around how much time they will spend researching their health. Because I think that's a contributing factor to stress. And hopefully I, I've helped to, to sort of outline how that stress can literally make you worse by upregulating your immune system. And there is hope. <laughs> there's a ton of hope. And well, the, the, the nice thing about it is there, there's a ton of hope uh, ton of in the hope. sense that simple things like going for a walk in nature, mm-hmm. like that green bar Delta showcase can have a massive impact on your immune activation. Uh, and probiotics is another, and also elemental dieting is another. But just to sort of tie together for people, uh, it's okay to take some time away and give yourself a little TLC and pick back up things like hobbies and, and times with friends and, and time in nature. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ruscio. I know Dr. C. Becker and I agree with you a thousand percent on that. Ah, everyone, let's take a breath. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, I include myself on that. You know, it's, it's something that I've oh, had to, um, yeah, I, I've had to relearn myself in terms of, you know, for me, uh, getting really busy with work can yeah. be like a black hole. And yeah. sometimes I just have to chill out and you know, get up and go for a walk in nature and just take some time for myself. So yeah, don't, don't uh, I guess, underestimate the importance of just that, that self-care, that, that time to chill out. And things will be okay. And sometimes these uh, small steps in the direction of relaxing your perspective a little bit can be hugely helpful. So I didn't mean to derail too far away from Elemental, but some of this research is just so exciting and compelling. I really felt like I should share it. No, I appreciate that. I know Dr. Seebecker does too. Hey, uh, go ahead and, and right. I know. Amen. Right. Go ahead and um, come back face to face with us, Dr. Ruscio. And I want to confirm, do we have you for another 23 minutes? Sure. So I have about a, a ton of questions for you. So Please. I will, I will ask you to just um, keep it short and sweet and give us the information for our next steps. Dr. Ruscio has lovingly um, offered to our communities 10% off on the Elemental Heal. There's the link. Please do use our link. There's the coupon code SIBO Ruscio. Um, you may even see a little pop-up come up on the website that you might be able to get 15% off if you give your email address there. So we got some nice discounts for you and um, we want to get into your questions uh, ASAP. So and Siobhan, part- sorry, yeah. sorry to cut you off, but one thing I, I should mention, I, I kind of glossed over this, sorry. Uh, so the way we've been using the Elemental Diet Yes, is we'll recommend people do anywhere from one to four days exclusively or at least semi-exclusively, meaning you try to be exclusive, but if you're really hungry or whatever, but you listen to your body and you don't make the rules really rigid. So if it's feeling good, totally elemental the first day, roll through to the second. If it's feeling good, then roll through the third. And at some point you'll probably say, okay, you know, I'm feeling like I want to get back to food. And whenever that is, you pivot to that hybrid approach of roughly half and half. doesn't have to be perfect. Some days can be more or less. And then you can use that as the Chrome study showed for a year or even longer and listen to your body in terms of, well, I'm, let's say I'm feeling great. I'm in this rhythm of half and half. I 
do breakfast elemental, I do lunch elemental, I have a late afternoon snack, and I have a, a nice hearty whole foods dinner. And if that's working for you, you need to stay on that train for however long you like. And then at some point you can go back to exclusive food. Maybe you travel somewhere for a destination wedding and it's, it's fun and it's great and there's alcohol and there's food and there's wine. But when you get back, you're saying, oh, my gut's feeling a little bit banged up. So I'm going to do a two-day reset and then go back to the hybrid for a little while. And you can weave in and out of this. And I think that's a really important thing to bear in mind is that it does not have to be this two-week exclusive. In fact, I can't remember the last time I recommended to use this two weeks exclusively because it's just too high of a bar and it doesn't seem to be uh, necessary. Because people get better. Yeah, people are able to get better with less. I think we're always looking for the minimal effective intervention. Sure. And just because the one study in SIBO did it strict two weeks, I don't think means we have to say everyone must do it for two weeks. And again, that's what the Crohn's and IBD literature has found is that this half and half application works quite well. So it's a little bit more like a, let's not hammer hard for two weeks. Let's go a little bit more gently for a longer period. And it seems to be similar regarding its effectiveness. But thankfully, right? It makes it much easier. So can, what about people do, yes, it does. And what about people doing other supplements during the elemental? From what you're saying, I hear you saying that that'd probably be fine. But what what is your yeah, thought? I don't think it makes a big difference one way or the other. If you have okay. a supplement plan that you feel like is really helping you, yep. then sure, like keep going with the supplements. If you're maybe saying, oh, I'm feeling kind of burnt out on the pills and the powders, then that's a nice chance to take some time off. Okay. We have a lot of questions, Michael. So I'm going to go rapid fire. Rapid fire. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. And, and everybody, please put your questions in the Q&A box. I can't look at the chat in the Q&A or I will totally panic myself. So here we go. <laughs> and I'm going to do my best. Um, are the ingredients in your elemental diet organic? Uh, yeah, they're almost exclusively organic. Okay. Um, Kim is saying that she tried it and she had uh, burning and itching head and face soon after drinking. She's not sure if she has histamine issues, doesn't think so. Oh, but does think so. Do you hear about that happening a lot? Any suggestions? Yeah, there's a small percentage of people for whom the elemental diet just doesn't sit well. Mm -hmm. And I think that actually is mainly from the maltodextrin. And we're working on a formula that's going to have a completely different class of carbohydrate in terms of what you can do about it. If you haven't tried the whey free version, you may want to try that. If you drank the formula really quickly, you may want to try drinking it slowly. And if you've done both those things, then I would look at other interventions, maybe probiotics as, as one. Uh, okay. Uh, Sherry, I don't usually look at the chat, but I have to say, he's not saying that getting well isn't a possibility. It is, but this is the whole point. Don't panic. Okay. You absolutely oh, have yeah, the oh yeah. Yeah, the, the whole yeah. point that's, is that- That's missing the, uh, the concept of his message, but I understand why yeah. you asked. And the, and the, the whole point may be that Less can truly be more. Like if you can relax the grip on your health a little bit, I think that just ends up allowing people to heal. And we see this in the clinic all the time where we'll give people some simple recommendations, recommend a health detox, meaning you can't do any health research for the next month and that they pick up some relationships, hobbies, spend more time in nature and they come back a different person. Not in every case, but in a lot of cases, they just needed to again, relinquish some of the control and give themselves some more pleasure in their life and not be so, you know, inundated with health research. So yes, you can continue to take your other vitamins, even though there are vitamins in this, correct? Correct. Okay. And then uh, if one is sensitive to casein, can they have the whey? Yeah. This formula is essentially casein free. Okay. And he, Kathy, he talked about the length of the diet. Um, if you're a vegan, are, are these uh, formulations vegan? Well, the talk, talk to me about the way, that. The way free is, yes. The way free is, okay. And, um, okay, yep, there you go. Uh, I saw one on MTHFR computer. I just want to address this. If you it. want to see me admittedly a little bit fired up, but look into a recent research review we did on genetic testing. We'll see that every, to my knowledge, randomized control trial that has looked at gene testing to personalize an intervention has failed, has not demonstrated any benefit. 
one of the studies that we mentioned in this review uh, video is a study giving those with MTHFR, whether heterozygous or homozygous, folic acid, folic acid, yes, they didn't folic acid and they didn't die. They actually saw a 30% reduced risk of stroke. So even though the MTHFR genotype is a thing, the effect size seems to be so small so as to be clinically insignificant. And I would recommend that if people are doing a rain dance because of MTHFR, they stop because you're you're just spinning your wheels. Okay. And um, people want to know the difference between each one. She's saying, I see all three. I don't know which is best. So who is each one for? Yeah, it's a wrong, wrong paradigm. None of these are best, right? It's again, right. the thinking of, I've got to do the, the best one. It just depends on what your needs are. If, again, like I said, if you know you have a problem with free protein, which most people won't, but a small subset may, then do the way free. If you're trying to be on a lower carb diet, then use a lower carb. And if you're not either one of those, I would just use the traditional version. And it's as simple as that. And if you're not sure, just pick one and start there. What's your favorite flavor, just to put you on the spot? The, the low carb chocolate is my favorite flavor. Okay. I know you have peach, vanilla, and chocolate, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. I, the peach is intriguing. I haven't tried it, but I'm... Um... Yeah, I, I, I was a little bit, when, when our team kind of pitched that idea, I said, peach. And when the flavor sample came through, I said, oh, this is actually much better than I thought it would be. So yeah, I wasn't thinking peach would be good, but it was actually pretty tasty. Lori's saying that the chocolate one is nice. Yes. Dr. Seebecker, what flavor do you have there? And I have two chocolates. Yeah, one is chocolate. the low carb chocolate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then the other one is the whey-free chocolate. All right. The sun is very strong here. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Which is um, rare in Portland. I'm, I'm jealous. Yeah. I'll take I'll take it for the five right. seconds we have it. <laughs> uh, what about CFO? So you talked about it at the very beginning. And by the way, we will send a replay out to everyone. There is the um, don't forget that coupon there in the links in the chat. Go ahead and scroll up. So what about right. CFO? You explained how it doesn't happen in the gut because it doesn't get far enough, but some right. people are experiencing um, thrush like. Yes, yeah, so that would be the one. Nose. The one exception would be if people have known either oral thrush, thrush or nasopharyngeal candida, which would be just candida in the throat where there's a lot of mucus. And this is because the sugars are going to be directly in contact before they get to the stomach. This is the key thing. And this is what delineates from CFO is once you get into the stomach, you have all this acid, and so nothing is going to grow. And to my knowledge, CFO does not occur in the first few feet of the small intestine, right? In the first, first few feet of the duodenum, because the chyme is acidic. So that's important to mention. So you have this couple feet after the stomach where the chyme or, or the contents is acidic, and nothing's going to be able to grow there. And that's also where the formula absorbs. So if it's oral thrush, if it's um, oral pharyngeal, uh, you know, something like this, the white tongue, then it may flare that. So that's something you may want to be careful with. I think you could try gargling with a probiotic and or like a microbial, and that seems to help some people. But that would be the one potential contraindication. I think, again, you can get around it with something like gargling of probiotics or antimicrobials. And with the CFO, be careful because a lot of times the CFO diagnosis is not actual, it's presumptive. Right. Also, uh, can I just quickly say that, yeah. um, Michael, I remember you used to speak quite a lot, on, a lot on this, that the coated white tongue that can often come during an elemental diet isn't necessarily thrush. Right. It seems to be transient and probably just because of the, the, the sugars directly interacting with, with the tongue. And if it is thrush or not, I'm I'm not sure. You know, we don't uh, diagnose thrush necessarily, but if people say they have a wet tongue and that's really the extent of their symptoms, my reply has always been, I'm not really worried about that. You know, let's let's yeah. zoom out. Are you less bloated and less pain, having better bowel movements? Is your energy better? And it's important to look at sort of the net outcome for the individual. But uh, is it thrush or not? Uh, that's actually even a little bit outside of, of my expertise in terms of how do we officially diagnose thrush? Because sometimes I think to your point, we use that term sort of loosely, uh, not even knowing if it actually is truly thrush. Okay. Um, let's talk maltodextrone because the, a lot of people are freaked out about the sugar. 
in the formulations. And then also honey and maple syrup, can that be used? So explain that if you would, please, the whole. Yeah, um, you know, honey is fine. Maple syrup is fine. And I, I think the the way to maybe shift the paradigm on this is we've been so messaged to that sugar is bad. Yeah. And to some extent, yeah, I get that. But what about all of you who have noticed a big plate of broccoli or asparagus or whatever doesn't sit well with you? Well, this is when all of the sugars are bound up in a lot of fiber and we're always told fiber is so good, but a lot of this violates the small intestinal rules. Meaning if there's too much fiber, if there's too much prebiotic, that can lead to imbalances, inflammation, overgrowth in the SI. And so the sugars have their merit because they'll absorb quickly and not feed that overgrowth and allow you to establish eubiosis. What really matters the most here is the outcome data, right? This is what I always say. Like, just show me the data. You can tell me blah, 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 about all the mechanisms and you can find gurus online who will scare the bejesus out of you because they'll say, this food contains this thing and it's going to kill you because of that. And then there's nothing in terms of, well, what happens to people when they actually eat that food? Coffee is a great example of this. We just did a robust review on coffee. Health outcome data are great. Coffee is good for you. People will say, well, it's got acrylamides and it's got these other compounds that, that will kill you or it'll throw off your stress hormones. And nope, coffee is actually good for your health. So same thing here. The outcome data, we showed documentation for IBS, eosinophic esophagitis, RA, and IBD. So we know that these diets work and that's what we should focus on and be careful not to let mechanism, right, sugars, scare us off from a therapeutic. So I would say, just try it. If it works well for you, great. If not, then there's other therapies in the kit that you can try. Okay. Um, so can you use the elemental or semi-elemental diet for CFO? Sorry, say that again? Can you use it for CFO? So, you know how you can use it for Crohn's and for SIBO. Can you use it for CFO? Well, again, I'm assuming most people who say they have SIFO are assuming they have SIFO and they just have symptoms that they're mapping on to SIFO, but don't actually know. This hasn't been officially studied, but my opinion on this, and just carefully clarify opinion from fact, my opinion on this is because SIBO and SIFO occur in the same areas and we can start with one, we will almost for certain start with the other. But again, the important thing here and like whoever asked this question, please listen to me. Unless you have true documented CFO, I would try the therapeutics and not get too caught up in trying to engineer your way to a solution based upon mechanistically how these solutions work. It is one of the worst things you can do is, is try to engineer what the solution should be, piece parting your way together to a hypothesis. Kathy, that's awesome that her RA numbers are far better after using your elemental heel. That's great. Um, do you do samples? Do you have like sample sizes? We do not. Okay. Um, and but something for, for any first time purchase, if it doesn't sit well with you, you can always return the product. So okay. Uh, if you Within want to how many just, days? Within how many days? I believe it's thirty. I mean, it's it's a reasonable, you know, interval. Okay. Okay. That's very, very important because not everybody has that policy. So that's very generous sure. of you. Sure. Thank you. Um, okay. I remember when you and I were doing um, something, it was like 2020. I was in my my house. I think we sent out the recording just the other day. Um, and I drank it while we were talking. And I remember like, it was so good. I was like guzzling the thing. And I was like, blood sugar, hello. And you're like, Siobhan, sip it. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have any tips like that for folks who people are asking about blood sugar etc yeah i mean because this is somewhat easy to absorb it's important not to drink it in like three minutes and just yeah. sip on it you know gradually throughout maybe a 30 ish minute period and simple as that Seriously, guys, I was just like hungry at the moment. And I was like, this is so good. Um, so go, go drink. And what about making it cold? I know the ice cubes sometimes help too with people with, um, you know, if they're super sensitive taste wise. Yeah, some people like it with ice. I've heard some people using the low carb, uh, the low carb version warm because it almost has like a, a hot cocoa yeah, okay. sort of consistency. So yeah, play with it. Okay, yeah. Um, all right. 
do you uh, retest for SIBA after four days elemental and how many days hybrid? Stop testing. He doesn't test, Lena. He is a I doctor. Wanted, <laughs> I, I, wanted, I think functional medicine testing is modern day snake oil. All right. It is almost for certain doing more harm than it is good. And it's taken me a lot of time to be able to say that. I'll just give you a quick aside because this is so important for people to understand. I recently did, I took one of my bowel movements. I put half in one functional medicine stool test, yeah. the other half in a different company's functional medicine stool test. Two of the best tests in the industry. One test, so I had candida. The other test, no candida, but I did have C. diff. Mm. Right. So the disparity between some of these tests is, is pretty long. Now, a SIBO test is validated, right? It's a good test. It's a valid test. But I see the testing clearly, please, please hear me on this, clearly does more harm than it does good. And I think people need to stop with the testing, chill out, use therapies that are well-studied and shown to be effective, and listen to their bodies. Okay, before anyone freaks out that he's saying something the opposite of what Dr. Seebecker and I talk about all the time, it's okay. It's okay. I can what? I can definitely support what you said about the stool testing. When I um when I was at the SIBO center, I ran double stool tests, is what I call it, on my patients. And I never ever, of course, you and I have talked about this, Michael. I never ever saw um two tests ever agree on the same person with their, their stool. N not yep. once. Right. We, and, I we, want, we, and I want to be careful again to say that the, the SIBO test, it is a validated test. Yeah. So that's what, and that's why I try to be careful about delineating that. But I do think if people are testing too much, especially if they're an anxious type and there's increased anxiousness in the uh, IBS community, that's where I think it can be detrimental. And then coming back to the genetic testing, that hasn't been shown to be helpful. And we just recently shared a case study of a gal who did $2,411 of testing gene testing, adrenal testing, stool testing, and food allergy testing. And she got so concerned, she developed an eating disorder. So she yeah. got no better. She was objectively harmed and she spent a lot of money. So this is why I'm taking more of a hard line on testing because as a clinician, seeing people coming in, there's just way too much testing done. It's absolutely bonkers. And I've tried to be tactful and like, rah, 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 like have like a very tactful academic way of calling this out. And I don't think people are getting it. So I'm just trying to be a little bit more pointed that you know, maybe you get one test, that's it. You right. don't get five. <laughs> this, this is the thing I want to say. You have to understand Dr. Ruscio's practice, right? Yes. You see people who come with $2,000 worth of testing because I, I just want people to hear that there's also, there's this other side of people who go to their doctors and they ask for a test, a simple True. test and are never given it. And so yeah. just to understand what we're saying here in, in balance, right? Like, yeah, I, I think that perspective is really important because you're right, important. Like people, people want to feel heard. And there are definitely conditions where that perspective on testing doesn't hold. Uh, I, I think for uh, a lot of functional GI care, we can reduce the testing down to very minimal. There's other areas blood sugar, obviously, thyroid, but you need testing. That's probably a better barometer than your symptoms. Um, but also, Allison, yeah, thank you for helping contextualize because we see a lot of people who've been to a few other doctors and they come You're in. You're like the third and fourth opinion guy, yeah. right? Like, they, 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 you know, like clearly, like like you've just said, getting an initial breath test, obviously we, we have to know what we're working with. There are, because if we give, there are certain therapeutics we give that could do harm without knowing that we're treating the right thing, so to speak. Like, you know, the classic example is what if somebody has lactose intolerance and we give them antibiotics and that's not the appropriate treatment. So, you know, there's reasons right. to do an initial test, but I just want people to understand there's a balance yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. And this is yeah. where we get and to see and I'm, and I'm at the other side of that balance where, you know, we're right. just seeing so many people who are being I think taking advantage of, and it's not with ill intent by the providers, but I, I think we've gotten this weird place where kind of like pharma to conventional medicine, the lab companies are that to functional medicine. You know, the seminars are so funded by the lab companies and it's good. We need some money to come into these areas to help fund research and fund education, but I don't think there's been enough suspicion regarding, I think labs have been looked at as, as sacrosanct and no one has been questioning well, are these labs fully validated? And there's been just too broad an adoption. 
and we're you know, the pendulum swung and we're, we're way over testing. If we can just come back a bit, that would be helpful. Okay. You have one minute, dude. We get it. Okay. I love you, <laughs> but I know this is super important, but I have like 93 questions, not answer. So this is what gives me Maybe my two seconds. Each question. <laughs> okay, okay. So, but um, here I want to, I literally am just like scrolling now and, and just do it. What about for kids? What about kids? Javon, I can I can go for another pen if you guys can. I, I oh a... hell yeah! Thank you. Okay. I love that. Okay, what about for kids? For kids, I, I try to be as light of a touch as possible, and it's because kids can develop eating disorders. I think at an even higher rate than adults, and there's some evidence supporting that. So, if you can make it fun and non-restrictive, like yeah, we're gonna do this thing in the morning. It's fun and it's fun, and you can frame it that way, and maybe have the kid place one or two meals per day, then yes. If it's going to be framed with any sort of, there's something wrong with you, we're restricting right. any negative valence, yeah. then I would steer around and away from that as best you can. Okay. But you can't use it in kids, right? The, the research shows us that it's safe for kids. And a lot of the research actually has been in kids with Crohn's and they've shown better growth outcomes for kids who use it to replace half their calories after let's say a year. But just be careful with the psychology. Right. A little, yep. Uh, Brian, just want to make sure you heard his opinion about that. We, you know, wear it loosely. Um, what about probiotics? Wait, before we talk about that, where do you ship, Dr. Ruscio? Do you ship internationally? We got Canada and UK asking. Yeah, we do. I mean, you know, different areas with customs can be more or less challenging, but we do ship internationally. Okay. And then... Um, how does it work for diverticulitis? Flare. I think I think fairly well. Um, yeah. I haven't seen any research on elementals for diverticulitis, although I may have missed it. Uh, in the clinic, from the small number of people who we work with who have uh, diverticulitis, it seems to be helpful. But I think it's worth a try. Do we add the MCT oil powder to the shakes? Like, take us through exactly how to do this. Like, what do we add to it? Do we not water? Does, yeah, you, you add, you water? add water, you yeah. add water, maybe ice. I would really try to add other things to it minimally because, you know, if you add avocado, all of a sudden you're adding spot map, right? Mm -hmm. um, which again, wouldn't be the end of the world and some food is okay, but just, you know, try to keep the alteration minimal. And the low carb has fat in it already. The way free has that in it already, the traditional does not. And you'll see in the usage instructions, it'll say either to add fat or not add fat. So you may add fat just to the one as an MCT powder is what we recommend because it's not greasy and messy. Mix and then drink. And the one thing I would be cognizant of is trying to do a general calculation in terms of your baseline caloric intake. A lot of people aren't tracking, so they don't know, but you can say maybe for a woman, 18-ish, 100 to 2,000 calories, a man, maybe 2,500 to 3,000 calories, and just try to get, you know, if you're doing half and half, let's say 2,000 calories is your goal, try to get 1,000 calories from the solution, because what you don't want to do is go from eating, let's say, 3,000 calories in a day, and then you have two shakes in a day, and you go from 3,000 calories to like 600 calories, and go, well, I was tired. Well, yeah, of course you're tired. You just went almost, you know, no calories. So just, I'd say use the solution amply to make sure you don't go into a, a vast caloric deficit. Do we have to add the MCT powder to it? No, you don't have to. Okay. Uh, does the chocolate flavor come from cocoa? Yes. Okay. Um, let's say someone had a stomach lining that was inflamed, leaky gut. I don't know what ED means for you, Susan. It can mean a lot of different things. So um, inflamed stomach lining and leaky gut. How do you feel about elemental diet for Great. that? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, is this really only a treatment? What are the specific issues for using this? So we talked about that in the beginning, but let's go through the list, right? So inflamed stomach lining, SIBO, Crohn's, colitis, you just want to take a break from digesting your food, which, you know, is exhausting on the gut. Talk to me about some other things too. Yeah. I mean, the way I would look at this is I think a, a, a bit upstream. If you're having digestive symptoms, I would give this a try and keep it as simple as that. And if it feels good for you, use more of it. And if it doesn't sit well with your system, then try something else. 
And what about doing probiotics at the same time? I know your triple therapy was the triple therapy that the little green powders guys sits on his site. They're fantastic. Um, is when you were showing us the studies about the cortisol level, were the same, are those the same strains or similar? Well, that was just bifidobacterium longum at a dose of one billion per day. With our product, we have essentially three, picture of three different bottles of probiotics. We take two capsules out of one, two out of the other, two out of the third, pull them apart, pour them into a single serving packet. That's our triple therapy probiotic. Um, you know, my, my view on probiotics is similar to elemental dieting. We don't have to make it highly complicated and fastidious. And I think a good, well-rounded probiotic, if you're um, if you're not really sensitive, the triple therapy is a good place to start. If you're somewhat reactive, then you actually want three separate bottles. So you can start one formula at a time, assess tolerance. If it doesn't sit well, put that one aside, move on to the other, try to go on all three. And if one doesn't sit well with you, leave that one to the side. Uh, the element, wait, wait, I just saw it. How do you counsel your patients that want to do an elemental or semi-elemental diet, but have sensitivity to, this isn't it. I know, Lena, you have a bunch of questions, but I wanted to ask this one. Here it is, because I think this is broader. Uh, you said elemental diet got the same results as element. You said semi-elemental diet got the same as elemental. Okay. So how do you choose which one to use for SIBO in a normal weight person who doesn't care about cost, taste, or ease? They just want results. And Lena's a family practitioner, a family doctor. Yeah. I usually will leave it up to the individual. I'll say, you know, you have three different options, just like I did here, right? Yeah, if you again. know you have a problem with whey, you can use the whey free. Or if you're trying to be low carb, you can use a low carb. Or if none of those apply, you can use the traditional. And you also may want to buy one of each because the flavor and the feel does shift a little bit from one to the other. And so sometimes for people just having that change of consistency, mouthfeel, and taste allows them to feel better about it when you use in the longer term. So really, I think simple is better because people have enough stuff going on to begin with. Yeah. So um, make it simple, yeah. Okay, what's the shelf life for Elemental Heal? I think somebody has some bottles that's been uh, past the manufacturer date. So what do you say? Hmm. You know, I, I wouldn't really be too concerned about it. I mean, I want to be careful here because we live yes. in such a litigious society. Absolutely. One thing I'll, I'll say in parallel to this, there was recently a study by, I'm blanking on the researcher's name, uh, is Zozora, is that, because it was a great name, I, I can't forget that name. They essentially did a meta-analysis and they found similar efficacy to heat-killed probiotics as to intact probiotics. And so that really opened up a lot for me in terms of, well, we don't have to be so meticulous about the freezer packs and the expiration date. Uh, and it's probably because even if it's a, a dead probiotic, the, the body, the, the polysaccharide or the cell wall will trigger some of these receptors in the gut that seem to have an attuning effect on the immune system. So I assume to some extent the same thing applies for the elementals. The longer you go out, the more there may be an issue of spoilage. So I would apply some logic. I remember, you're smart, you're empowered, smell it. Does it smell funny? Taste it. Does it taste funny? And then try it. How does it feel? And if it's okay, keep going. And if you get any weirdness, then I would be cautious. Okay. What are the pros and cons of consuming herbs or herbal formulations while being on the elemental diet? And what success effectiveness have you observed if you do the elemental diet, then herbs or herbs, and then our pharma followed by just elemental? Yeah, I don't think it makes a big difference one way or the other. This is where just respecting the response of the individual is mm -hmm. probably best. We've been using sort of the, the the hierarchy that we're roughly following now. It varies from person to person, but the general structure is diet and lifestyle. So you know, maybe chill out, meditate, get in nature, you know, get back to sort of that that center, that balance. Elimination diet and or low FODMAP diet. That's kind of stepish one. Then we aim for the triple therapy probiotic or as many formulas as the person can tolerate, like we talked about a moment ago. Give that some time. And by the way, some evidence is showing that people may peak in terms of their improvements at three months. And this is actually news to me, but uh, so it's important to keep that in mind that with probiotics, you're looking for at the first month, is there a trend of improvement? 
not is everything improved, but is there a trend? And then you may want to ride that wave and change nothing until three months or later, because some research is showing that that is when the pinnacle of, of improvement occurs. And after the probiotic intervention, we usually are doing the elemental and then preserving antimicrobials for a little bit further down the line. And that's just, I think we feel that's a bit more mild. Uh, I don't think, you know, I think that's open for debate, but that's at least how we've been using it. And it's much easier to justify when we're using that one to four day reset to hybrid relaxed application. And that's what's been nice for us is as we've taken it from two weeks exclusive to a little bit easier of an on-ramp, we can utilize this therapy a little bit earlier on. What about people who are underweight? You already mentioned, make sure you're getting your proper calories, but I want to yeah. repeat it loud and clear, please. Thanks. We have one <laughs> minute. <laughs> Yeah, ensure that you're not going too low calorie. There is some evidence that has found the semi-elemental formulas are better for weight regain. And weight regain does happen because of the pre-digested and easy to absorb nature of these formulas. So for those who are underweight, the elemental diet can really be a godsend for some people. They'll have more energy. They'll be back in the gym. They'll be gaining weight. So uh, just as long as you're consuming enough, then yeah, definitely something worth considering. Uh, last and certainly not least, um, mothers that can't, won't breastfeed, the standard infant formulas are horrendous. Can your products be used to create a better formula for infants? Do you have any suggestions? Great question. I, I don't know offhand. Um, I would assume it could be integrated and then maybe check with your OB, doula, or whoever's kind of going to give you the final okay, but it could be a good starting point. Yeah. Uh, but again, check that with someone who can give you the, you know, finer point delineation on what you need. Thank you so much, Dr. Ruscio. It is 10 past. Thanks for going along with us. Thank you, Dr. Allison C. Becker, for your fabulous co-hosting and contributions and thoughts and ideas and dialogue. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Pop some love into the chat for Dr. Ruscio and Dr. C. Becker. And we'll talk to you soon, Dr. Ruscio. It was great to see you. Mwah. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Let's guys. Do this again great soon. You. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye, bye. Thank you. All right. I know that was a lot to think about. Thanks, Dr. C. Becker. And so, you know, the um, stool testing thing, I just wanted to address that. Like, so Dr. Seebecker and I have a course and she teaches the SIBO Pro course and all of that. And we do love the SIBO breath tests. We never talked about SIBO, not SIBO stool tests, just stool tests in general because of what they were talking about. But people approached us and were like, hey, what about this? What about this? What about this? And so we actually created an account at Rupa Health. Um, and maybe Clarissa, you can pop that into the chat. So if you wanted a stool test without going to a practitioner per se, Dr. S you could actually get one through Rupa through this account that we created. Dr. Seebecker does not interpret the test. This is like you doing your research or taking it to your practitioner. We're not suggesting it. We're literally just creating it as a service for you all in the community. So if um, if you go to see, there it is. She's the best. Thank you, Clarissa. So that's it. The prices are competitive to say the least. There is a 7% charge that Rupa charges. And there's, I think like a just check it out. I think there's like a $25 service fee or something. Um, but if you wanted to, I'm not saying don't go to your practitioner, but if you wanted to do like a follow-up test or you wanted to check out if the test, you know, a test and then walk into a practitioner's office with the test, that's kind of what it's there for. Um, so I just wanted to mention that to you, but definitely go to Dr. Ruscio's site, use coupon code SIBO Ruscio. You're going to get that 10% off. Please do use our link and uh, it supports the work. You're going to be paying actually less because we negotiated this with them. It's been a year in the making this webinar today. So I'm very, very glad so many people came. I'm very, very glad you came. Take a breath. I know it was a lot. You know, sometimes in the past when I was really, really in SIBO panic, I would buy a supplement and then I wouldn't take it when I got it at home because it was almost like the mere act of buying it was like, Okay, that was a lot. <laughs> like, oh, wait, I'm not getting a result because I ended up not taking it. It was a very strange psychological place I was. Get it at home. Try it. See what you think. He's saying use it with your own food. Follow like every day. Every time you sit there to take the, to have a, a supplement or a, um, the drink, decide right then and there if that's what you want to do that day. Now, recently we did a masterclass with, um, two wonderful practitioners and they were elemental diet purists. So they were very into, you know, don't do it with food, 
don't do it with, you know, that just they were purists. And they said that. And so he's not a purist. So don't be overwhelmed. Instead, embrace and listen, go inside and listen to what works for you. We just wanted to give you some options. So go take that walk, go have a beautiful day. You have hope, you have options, find out what works for you and don't give your power away. Really, this is about you being an empowered. This is SOS, save ourselves. This is the whole platform of SIBO SOS. It used to mean I wanted someone to come save me. And boy, did I. And then I realized I needed to save myself. So take this information and turn it, this learning into your thinking and your intuition. And I have beautiful, beautiful faith and hope that you will make progress. So inch by inch, it's a cinch. Cinch, hang in there. Um, Lori is saying she did the elemental heal way free for three weeks and it reduced my gas by half. That is fantastic. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Brian would still opt for being a purist. Yeah, cool. Brian, that's what's appealing to you. And I get that. That's definitely the way we have been, you know, preaching it. But, you know, I also love the elemental diet as a meal substitute because sometimes I feel like, oh my gosh, I'm so full. We're going out to dinner. What am I going to do? I'll do an elemental heal and then I'll, you know, have an appetizer or something. And knowing that I'm a very uh, nourished or you have the big holiday meal and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't eat for three days. I'm just totally stuffed. Then the next day for breakfast, you have an elemental shake. So use this as a tool to help you be empowered with how you want to live. And this is really what I'm talking about. I am not a person who believes in moderation. Now listen to this one. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Melody. Because moderation of a cup of hemlock tea would be deadly. So I say, use your judgment, use your discernment. That's what I say. So I think the whole thing about moderation can go, you know, tricky very quickly. So, you know, just because something's natural doesn't mean it's good or bad. Just because something's a pharmaceutical for me doesn't, in my personal world, doesn't mean it's good or bad. It means I want to look at it and discern and use my judgment and my wisdom and my, you know, common sense and the resources that I have available without going crazy. Cause I have been there. I really have. Ooh, brutal. It's brutal. It was more than a part-time job. It was an obsession. Fortunately, it didn't last forever. And at one point I just said, that's it. I'm eating whatever I want. I'm taking a break it was my version of going out for that walk in nature. And it totally reset my brain. I was able to come back to things fresh. So if this is exciting to you, if you're like, I like the idea of this elemental heal, I think I could really use it as a tool in my life. Great. And if you're like, not right now, but it's good to know that's cool too. So just wanted to give you some of my perspective. I appreciate you all so much. Thank you for being here. And we have a lot of exciting things coming down the pike, um, including di uh, Digestive Disease Week, as you may know, is the world's largest digestive gastroenterology conference. We have time booked with Dr. Mark Pimentel. Can't wait. And we have time booked with Dr. Ali Razai. They are the ones leading the MAST program at Cedar sinai Lots of new information coming down the pike. We will be mailing out our sessions with them probably in June, end of May. So um, we've got, we're, it's like a little mini series on Digestive Disease Week. Um, so we're very excited about that. And um, I don't know, we've got a lot more, a lot more, we're busy this year as well. And we just want to help you all get the proper information. So you don't have to be in panic, knowing that it's coming from trusted authorities and people who have your best interest at heart and um, try to save you some money here and there as much as possible. Okay. Thanks, Clarissa. Mwah. Thanks, everybody. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Thanks, Pam and Judith and Margaret and all that. If you want 15% off on 20,000 supplements. I do want to mention this. We do have a uh, 15% off on full script, which is Dr. Seebecker's um, professional dispensary. Last month, our community saved over $11,000 by shopping there. Like they have this little calculator thing that they do on the website for us is like behind the scenes. We were so excited. So um, if that appeals to you, then please, please, please join us for that. Am I 15 minutes late to be somewhere, Lena? You're asking me a question. Yikes. No, I don't think it's today, Lena. Mercury is retrograde, so I'm scared. Um, stand by. 
we have the premium version of the SIBO recovery roadmap. I don't have that down for today, Lena. I'm going to stop the recording. Okay, thanks, everybody. <laughs>